Welcome to Casual Friday. I'm going to wrap up a uh, finish it February and show you the final things that I finished. What I didn't end up finishing, but will in the very uh, near future. And then I want to talk about some mittens that I got really excited about and their connection to my family history. So I have three finished or nearly finished things to show you from for Finish It February. Actually, two of them are things that I finished and one is a brand new thing that I started and finished in the past week. So a couple of months ago, I knit a one booty for my grand nephew to be. And I, I had knit a bunch of, I was knitting a bunch of stuff and I knit one booty. And I, I don't typically have second sock syndrome, but I do have second booty syndrome. I don't think I had ever finished a second booty ever. And, but I finally did. I finished these are these little dino booties. Now they need buttons on them. I just bought some buttons. And so I'll be sewing those on later today and packaging these up with some things to send to my brother. I had made him two pairs, I finished two pairs of socks for my, my brother this month. And so I thought I'd mail the booties in the package along with those socks. But in addition, I started and finished a hat for my grandnephew, my brother's grandson, based on a request that my brother had had. When I went to Michigan in December for my niece's baby shower, when I got to the airport at the gate, I started casting on for a little hat for the baby. His name's Henry. And I used leftover sock yarn. So I dug through all of my leftovers until I found something that seemed like it weighed enough uh, to, in order to make this little hat. And I didn't really recognize the yarn and it wasn't until I was knitting with it and I start, saw the stripes start to um, show up in the hat that I realized that the socks that I had originally knit with that yarn were for the baby's grandmother, my sister-in-law. So she was really, my sister-in-law was really delighted with that. My brother said, well, can't you make me a hat with the leftovers from my socks? And I said, I know, <laughs> because there's hardly any yarn left over. But for the two socks that I did for my, the two pairs of socks I finished for my brother this month, one of them I used, uh, well, for both of them, I used contrast uh, yarn for either the heels or the toes. So there was this blue pair I showed you last week where it's blue striped yarn and then I used this blue contrast color for the toes. So I was looking at how much of the, the striped yarn I had left. I had more than I would have had if I knit the, the entire pair with that blue yarn. And I started to, to look to see what I could do. And originally I thought, well, maybe I'll make the same hat that I had made for the baby before, but just in this other yarn. And I really wasn't sure I had enough. So I started thinking about it. And then I realized I had made my brother one of those 1898 hats um, and given that to him in December. So then I had the idea to make an 1898 hat for the baby, but to use sport weight yarn instead of the worsted weight yarn. So the sock yarn I'd, I'd used to knit these socks for my brother was sport weight, and I ended up being able to use exactly the same stitch count, same number of rows, everything about the hat exactly the same, but just with thinner yarn and smaller needles, and it may produce a hat that's going to fit Henry probably next winter. So, so this is the little hat. So I used the contrast yarn for the headband part because that needs, that's about two thirds of the entire stitch count of the hat is just in this headband. And then the crown, there's a lot of decreases. It's only about a third of the amount of yarn that you need. And so I did have enough yarn to make him a little hat. Now I did a little something different with this hat. I don't know if you can see how at the top, it looks kind of like I-cord here, which is, is kind of mirrors what's going on at the bottom. Now, this is actually slip stitches because the band is double layered. It's knit flat and wide and up the center are three slip stitches and that becomes the turning point here. So the two, you have these two layers of fabric here. And normally what you would do is you would pick up underneath those slipped stitches of the selvages and those slip stitches would end up on the inside of the hat. So here's the hat I made for myself. 
a few weeks ago and you can see how it doesn't have that ridge if you look on the inside you can see that ridge around um, the top here on the pearl side so I instead I had the wrong side of the hat facing me when I picked up in the round along the slip stitch edge and then once I picked the stitches up then I turned and so the right uh, side was facing me and then I knit around and because I did contrast I picked up stitches using the the um, contrast yarn or of the solid color yarn and then once I wanted to work in the round with the right side facing me I used the striped sock yarn so I think it turned out pretty cute and I think it's a nice little combination of the same hat that his grandpa has using the yarn that his grandpa's socks have so that I was uh, really delighted with that so the last thing that I completed I uh, haven't woven the the ensign this was this that cowl that I originally had created as a swatch in order to teach different stranded color work techniques and at the beginning of February I said oh well, I'm done with this I'm not, I'm not going to do anything with it. I originally had thought, oh, maybe I would turn it into a cowl pattern and write up the instructions and then sell it. And then I was like, oh, I'm not, I can't be bothered. And besides that, I have these, you know, these three motifs. Uh, this one was knit with parallel floats with the dark dominant, parallel floats with the light dominant, and then rotating floats so there's no yarn dominance. But when I showed this at the beginning of the month, there was an, a fourth a, a motif above it that didn't match the others so that that I had used to demonstrate some other technique maybe weaving weaving as you go I'm not even sure what I did so I was not going to do anything with it and a lot of people said no 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 make a pillow do this do that I'm like well I don't want a pillow um, so I'm not going to do that and so then that was when I did the sunk cost fallacy video where I talked about um, whether or not when I evaluate UFOs uh, I decide, do I still want this? Do I still like it? Do I still want it? And is it worth it to me to spend the time necessary to complete it and to turn it into some sort of product? Because a lot of times, the things that are in my UFO pile are not product knits. They're not gifts. They're not anything that has a due date. They're not for anybody specifically. They are often purely an exercise in experience with a, a stitch pattern or a process or something like that they're they're technically for me so if it's not something I want I don't usually feel obligated to finish it so in this case I sat down I, I thought about it again after there were so many comments I thought okay well let's say I did turn this into a pattern would that amount of time necessary be worth it to me to do that and so I decided I was going to go ahead and do it. So I, uh, I, I was finishing this. I finished it off. I cast off. I, I ripped back the extra motif that didn't belong in here. And then I, and then I finished um, the end. And I looked at it and I thought, geez, it seems awfully big. Now, I don't wear cowls. So I don't really know how long they ought to be. <laughs> so I tried it on. And I thought, this just seems like it's too long. Let me let me just show you what it looks like. See if I can do it without messing up my hair. So it, you know, it's it's long. It's long and I don't know that it does any favors to have it all bunch up, bunched up like that. Again, I don't wear cowls, so I don't know. So I went and I looked up the cowl that I'd use as kind of a reference when I was first designing this, because I, I didn't even know how big around it really should be. And I looked at that cowl, and essentially that cowl was about as long as two of these repeats, not three. So one of the issues that I have when I work on it, do a finish it February or finish it year or whatever, when I, when I have a pile of UFOs and I'm evaluating them and trying to decide whether to go forward, often I don't know why I put it to the side or I think I know why I put it to the side. And if I think I know why I put it to the side, sometimes that's only part of it. I can remember a little bit of it and I don't remember everything. And it isn't until I actually invest more time in it and get to a certain place that I realize, oh, this is why I decided not to finish this. So in the case of this cowl, I think what I realized was that the cowl really needed two repeats of the motif. And I needed three repeats of the motif in order to demonstrate all of the techniques the way that I wanted to. 
And once I'd gotten that far, and I wasn't going to rip it back because it's always it's a it's a really great reference to use as a teaching tool. Uh, but once I'd gotten further than than would make a reasonable cowl, I thought I might as well just keep uh, adding on to it with another motif. So that's what I think happened <laughs> with all all of this. So now what I have to decide is is this it or um, my choices, if I'm going to turn this into a pattern, my choices are to, to rip back the two and then knit. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to eliminate one of these different methods. Because if I do turn this into a pattern, I think this is a really excellent um, sample to have in the pattern to show the effect of working the stranded color work um, in different ways. And then the knitter could decide which one they liked or if they wanted to experiment with two different methods, whatever that they wanted to do, they, they could do that. So that would be, this is still valuable as it is. I don't like how much it's rolling. I haven't washed and blocked this, so I don't know why it's rolling quite as much as it is at the top. So then I would still have to write up the pattern, which I had committed to, well, maybe I would, that I would do that for this cowl pattern. But at this point, it means I also have to re-knit it. And I just don't know if I want to do that. So I'm going to sit on this for a little while and then make that decision. I always learn something about myself and about myself as a knitter when I do one of these finish it Februarys or finish it years or if I just decide I want to reduce my UFO pile a little bit. I always learn something about myself. And what I learned this month is not something that I learned for the first time. It was just, it was, it was something I had to learn probably for the fifth time for it to finally sink in with me how I can avoid the kind of problem I just had with this cowl, which is, and, and what I mean by that is avoiding having to spend time knitting and then realize, oh, this is the problem and then reevaluate do I want to continue or not. Sometimes I just I don't realize there's a problem and then I realize what the problem is and I have to rip back. So I could have saved myself a lot of time if I'd updated my project notebook in Ravelry with the problems. But what happens is I happily start a project page for every new project. I put in the yarn, put in the needle size, put in my progress, what's going on, what went wrong, how I fixed it, um, if I'm still continuing to go. But at the moment when I get fed up or make a mistake or something like that, I I put it to the side for a timeout and then I just put it out of my mind. I don't want to think about it. And so I don't even go on to my uh, project notebook page in Ravelry and say what went wrong or say why I changed my mind. And I think that's what I learned this time is that I need to just make myself update my project. Uh, even if I think I'm going to be returning to it very soon and I'll remember everything, I just need to do that. So that's my, the main thing I learned because I think it's going to save me a lot of time in the future, particularly when I'm just evaluating the projects. Like, why did I even put this to the side? Because that, that's been a real trouble <laughs> for me in the past is like, I love this. I love this. I don't know why I put it to the side. And then I'll spend hours thinking I'm moving forward on it before I realized what the fatal flaw was. And then I have to not only backtrack, I have to rip things out and, and do a, a bunch of things in order to then go forward. And I, I could save myself a lot of time, either by realizing this isn't something I should continue with, or just realizing, oh, here's the problem, and let's start fixing the problem now, instead of investing three, four, or five hours or several days and before I realized what the problem was and then have to go back and fix it. Oh, what did I not finish? Now, when I do a finish at February, I never expect that I'm going to finish everything. Although at the beginning of this month, I did think that was going to happen because I thought I only had five things until I took everything out and realized I had more than a dozen things. So there were a couple of things I knew that I wasn't going to finish this month. One was this purple cabled sock that's been sitting in there for months or for years because I remember how boring it was to, to do the first one, but it turned out really nice. And so I, I just keep keep on thinking at some point it's, I'm just going to suck it up and, and do that second sock, but I didn't do it this month. I didn't 
uh, progress at all on the Aran sweater. That's really something that has to start um, from scratch. And so I knew that that wasn't going to get finished and, and I didn't commit, I didn't really do anything on that, but I will be fairly soon, I believe. Then there was a sweater that, where is it? Then there was this sort of half of, well, the back was sort of two thirds of the way done. It, it was the, the sweater that I was using with hand painted yarn. If you see it in person, there's a definite, you know, sort of stripe that this yarn is, is darker than this yarn in the hand painted. And so I, it's gonna bug me and it needs to be re -knit and probably redesigned. So this is something that at some point in the future, I will actually sit down and finish the design and, and decide how I'm gonna handle all of these different skeins of hand painted yarn, how I'm going to work with them um, so that they blend. That's always a challenge with these hand painted yarns is, is, is using them in a project that, that consists of more than one skein in a way that isn't um, obviously like striped and, and weird and that there's not weird pooling and things like that. So I knew that the Aran sweater and this sweater and that sock were not going to happen. The Edwardian sweater, I had hoped that I would actually buckle down and re-knit the cuffs and the neck and then get it sewn together before the end of the month. So I realized when I you know, did the giant mittens and then I did this little half for Henry that I really have this need right now, sort of this need for speed knitting that is so satisfying to me to start something and finish it. Um, in just a couple of days. And that Edwardian sweater is a, was a bigger project than most sweaters that, uh, that I can do in a three week period. I, I worked on it a lot longer. And then, not only that, but I realized I kind of have some sweater fatigue right now. In the past year, so last year in Feb finished at February, I finished two sweaters that had been sitting around because they were longer than three week projects. So I, I did the two sleeves of a, of a cardigan. Well, two sleeve, I did the two sleeves of two different cardigans. So I finished two cardigans. Then I knit two pullovers that were the same pattern, uh, which is something I hardly ever do for each of my daughters. I knit a baby sweater uh, in a stranded color work for my daughter, uh, for the family my daughter's an au pair for in the Netherlands. So it's like I, the baby was just gonna be born. We, I made a little sweater and hat set for that baby. Then I made a sweater for um, my grandnephew, a little grandpa cardigan for my, my grandnephew to be. And then I knit myself uh, a cardigan with bulky weight chainette yarn. So it's that's a lot of sweaters. And normally in a, in a given year, I would only probably finish or knit two sweaters. I, I might start one and then knit another one. But or finish one and knit another one. So that's a lot of sweaters. And I think I just, and I haven't done that many small projects. So I really needed and, and really been enjoying um, some small things. So I will be getting back to that Edwardian sweater soon, I hope. I just, I think I need a couple more small projects before I can return to, to a big one. So in the past few months, I've been talking about my knitting group. And some of the things that I've been doing that I've had a lot of fun with that were a result of my interactions with my knitting group. So one of the things was some, um, someone asked me to help them with this unfinished scarf project. It was a charity knit that a woman named Karen that I had known years ago had, had begun and didn't complete before she died. And her knitting group was trying to complete all her charity projects and they didn't have a pattern for that and asked, could I help? So I did that. And then, and from the same woman, I found out about these giant mittens that the burn unit at uh, Hennepin County Medical Center needs for their um, burn patients and frostbite patients to wear over their bandaged hands. So I knit th that, that pair of mittens. But um, the woman who has been bringing all these things to knitting group, and uh, she also was knitting a pair of mittens about a month ago that she brought in and she was showing them to me and they had a really interesting thumb gusset construction that she was describing to me and I couldn't quite picture in my head, but it was really interesting. And she was excited about it and I was excited about it. Well, a couple of weeks ago, she brought in the book. She told me what the book was from and she said, I've got two copies of this so you can, you can borrow it for a while if you'd like. So the book that she brought me was called Flying Geese and Partridge Feet. 
And the book is by Robin Hanson and then with Janetta Dexter. So Robin Hanson had written a book a few years before she wrote this one that was called, I think it's called Fox and Geese and Fences. And they were mitten patterns from Maine. She had lived in Maine as a small child for a very short amount of time. And then as an adult, she moved uh, back to Maine with her husband and kids. And she really wanted to feel like she was a, a, a native Maine person. She was a knitter. And she became fascinated with these sort of folk traditional mittens that in, in, the, in Maine. And she w was learning about them and she was displaying them in and, and like historical museums and stuff like that. And, and, and through that, she met other knit, she, and she published this book. And then she began receiving uh, patterns for other mittens that she had never seen before. And during all of that, she met this woman named uh, Janetta Dexter, who was basically doing the same thing with mittens, but up in like Nova Scotia, New Brunswick area. And so the two of them saw that some of the mitten patterns, some of the constructions that the two of them had seen in these two different places really overlapped. And that's not that surprising because Maine is right on the border with Canada. And in, over you know the course of the past few hundred years, people would move back and forth across the, the borders, either traveling or doing um, business or just moving back and forth um, across the borders. So I started looking through this book. Now, I, I've talked about this before, about I, I do, I've been doing genealogy for about nine years. And when I started, uh, my goal was to find my immigrant ancestors because we really didn't have the kind of immigrant stories in my family that my husband's family has. They all came through Ellis Island around the turn of the 20th century, give or take, you know, 10, 15 years. And I just didn't have any of those stories. And so my assumption was that all my ancestors arrived in the United States sometime in the 19th century when immigration was, you know, um, fast and furious, because that's, that's just what I assumed. And I realized fairly soon that the reason that there were no immigrant stories in my family is because on both sides of my family, I have people who arrived on the first boat. So like I have Mayflower ancestors on my dad's side, so those English descent. And on my mom's side, uh, I have family that came on the first boat that the uh, families that the Dutch West India Company brought to New Netherland, which is now called New York. And they came in 1624. So both sides of the family have been here for 400 years. Now I do have some immigrant ancestors that came here in the 19th century, but by and large, you know, we go back like 400 years. And so even the immigrant ancestors I have that was in the 19th century was like in the 1830s. So it was still 200, you know, almost 200 years ago. So we don't have the kind of, I don't have the kind of cultural uh, attachment that a lot of people I know have. So to the old country, like we don't have any like favorite family recipes or traditions on at holiday times that, that get that are passed down or um, we just don't have any of that. And, and as a knitter, I've always been fascinated by these knitting traditions that you find all over Europe and where you'll see like these traditions that are sort of related to each other, but they have their very distinct motifs that they use or certain color combinations they use. They just, they use a lot of the same techniques, but in different ways and that people can identify, you know, into very small regions. Well, these came from here and these came from there. And, and I'm fascinated with this, but, and I really like learning about all of them and, and trying them out and see what, what can I learn in, from this technique that's really interesting and apply it to somewhere else. And one of the things that, that I uh, always found interesting is mittens and how they're like socks where there's so many different ways to put in a heel into a, into a sock. There's so many ways of putting a thumb into a mitten. And these differences a lot of times have to do with um, the stitch patterns that the people in those areas are using and what makes it easy to keep a pattern intact while also adding the thumb. So it's something I've always been really interested in. So I've always loved, you know, mittens and knitting traditions and all of that kind of thing, learning about them. And I've never felt that, that the United States really had any of its own knitting traditions that, you know, none, none that I was aware of. So I started reading through this book 
And that was sort of the point that of this book is that these are mitten patterns from Maine and Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, that they have roots, most of them in English patterns, um, but a lot of them have unique constructions, unique ways of doing thumbs, certain stitch patterns that are maybe are related to stitch patterns you might see in England, but they really sort of have their own identity. And so there are these folk mittens from like the Northeast of the United States or uh, Southeast of Canada. And I, and I thought, well, that's really interesting um, that there is the, uh, that the, there are these traditions and the thumb gussets, the thumb constructions are really fascinating. I'm reading through and I'm like, I can't quite picture what they're talking about. And I know a lot of knitters have the same issue. They're reading through instructions and they can't picture what's going on. And a lot of knitters are very quick to say, well, I'm a visual learner, so I need to see somebody do it. I need a video or I need this or I need that because I'm a visual learner. The truth is we're all visual learners to some extent. We have, that's you know part of our anatomy. We have eyes, we take in information through our eyes. But I learned to knit in the 1980s when all I had was a written description, maybe a draw, one drawing, maybe a, one photograph. And I didn't know any other knitters, so I couldn't watch anyone else. So what I've always done is, I don't assume that because I can't picture what's going on by reading it, that I won't be able to get the visual information that I need in order to, to make the thing. So what I do is I follow the pattern until I get to that point. And then I have the yarn and needles in my hands and then I read each step of the directions to see if I can make sense of them. And nine times out of 10, I can get it immediately. Um, the reason I couldn't visualize it is because I'd never seen it before. Well, I'm seeing it now. Like now I understand what they're talking about when they're saying lift this strand and do that. I, I couldn't picture it in my head because I hadn't seen what the knitting that led up to that point was going to produce. So I would recommend to any of you who, who say, I'm a visual learner, I need videos, to just try doing it without a video. Don't, don't assume that because you can't picture it from reading it that you won't be able to do it once the yarn and needles is in your hand. That's what I'm seeing in this book. There are these constructions that I'm not quite understanding what they're going to do. And I know that once I get there, in the pattern, it will all make more sense to me. So I was looking, well, maybe I can get my uh, hands on a used copy of this for me to own. But I, what I found out was that uh, Robin Hansen, who wrote Fox Geese Fences and then with um, Janetta Dexter wrote this one. Robin wrote most of this and there were parts in there that Janetta um, contributed. In 2006, Robin combined the, those two books of hers a, into this bigger volume, but at the same time, she used a tech editor and, and created the format for the patterns that are more standardized and easier to read. What she had done in this original book was to try to eliminate things like abbreviations that she felt were confusing, and she was uh, incorporating context and historical information into it, which made it really interesting to read, to read, but then to, went to knit a pattern when I was like, well, here she's saying the pattern starting there. She's got all this, like, where are the instructions for the pattern? It would take a few pages before I could get there. And I, and I am able to do it, but this format is much better. So I, I checked this one out of the textile center because I wanted to compare the two to make sure that the things that I was interested in the first one are also going to be included in this. And for the most part, they are, as far as I can tell. I, I just got this yesterday, so I haven't been able uh, to get through the whole thing. But this book, Favorite Mittens, is still available. And it has um, all of these um, traditional patterns of uh, Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and even into Newfoundland, uh, Labrador, those areas, some of the things are in there. So years ago, I made a pair of thrummed mittens. Those are these really puffy mittens where you incorporate unspun wool uh, every few stitches, you would knit some of that into it and it makes them really puffy on the inside full of, of wool and they kind of felt down over the years and, they, and they're pretty warm. 
and they are my warmest mittens. I still wear them with a pair of liner gloves inside because I wear them to the dog park where I'm outside for a long time. So I need to take the mitten off to um, pick up the dog poop. Uh, and I don't want to have my bare skin exposed to sub-zero temperatures. So uh, I, I keep a little glove on. So those are for sure are in this book, the Thrummed Mittens. But what's really interesting about flying geese is that these the the knitters in that that region found so many different interesting ways of adding additional like yarn scraps or unspun wool different ways to add warmth to mittens and that's what i'm finding to be really interesting so um so i want to try out uh quite a few of those and again I'm like, oh, this is really interesting. It's a knitting tradition, again, if, of Canada and North America, just not my knitting tradition. So then I was, you know, reading through this book. I was just reading it like a novel, this exciting novel, reading through it. And I got to this page right here that says Chipman's Block Mittens. And these are mittens that were, uh, the pattern for them was sent to this woman, Janetta, who is writing it with Robin Hansen. And this pattern as mittens is not included in the favorite mittens. Instead, they have a pattern called Chitman's Check Wristers. So it's a fingerless mitt pattern. I think it's because that's Robin's book. And so she was, she didn't want it. She's not using Janetta's pattern um, contribution, but she is using the stitch pattern in a different way. So I was reading it and I thought, well, it's, it's a really cool pattern because it looks, if you look at it, it, it looks almost like it's plaid, but it's a very simple pattern. So it's an eight round pattern. So on one round, you are alternating three lights with three darks. So three, three light, three dark, three light. And you do that for a second round so that you have two rows of of three lights and two rows of three darks next, like checker next to each other. And then you do two rows of what they call salt and pepper, where you're alternating light, dark, light, dark on the first round. And then on the second round, if it was a light, you do a dark. If it was a dark, you do a light. And then, so those are the first four rows of the pattern. And then the next four is when you had like three light, three dark, up, up here you have three dark, three light. Uh, and then you have the salt and pepper again. So it creates this it's very simple, but yet it creates this sort of illusion that there's something else going on. So it's immediately drawn to the stitch pattern. I thought that's really interesting. I love how simple it is and yet how interesting and more complex it looks. And then there was a little paragraph that says, Chipman's block was sent to Janetta, the co-writer of this book, from New Brunswick, where Chipman has long been a common family name. And that's when I went ding, 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 ding. I immediate, my immediate reaction was, I bet you anything I'm related to the Chitmans in New Brunswick. I just had that immediate thought. I want to tell you why and how I proved it and how I feel this connection to the stitch pattern, even though none of my family has ever lived in Canada and certainly not in New Brunswick, but I, but all of a sudden I feel like I have a connection to a traditional uh, knitting pattern that I never had before. So as soon as I read that oh, Chipman was an old family uh, name in New Brunswick, I knew that, well, it's an old family name in New England as well, because I have an ancestor named John Chipman. He's my 10th great grandfather. And he came here in 1631 on the ship Friendship. So I had a feeling that whatever, whoever it was that settled in New Brunswick that was named Chipman was probably related. I, this is just a feeling I had that were related to him. And then I thought they probably ended up in Canada because they were loyalists. So in the American Revolution, the war, it was everybody who was fighting, it was English. So you either had the people, the colonists who wanted independence or you had colonists who did not want independence and, and wanted to, to stay with England. And then England, you know, sent money and whatever to fight this war. Well, once the war was over and, and the colonists won, the loyalists left. They like, we got to get out of here. And they went to Canada, a lot of them. And a lot of them were awarded land by the English crown for their loyalty to England during this war. That was what I was thinking is, I bet you anything, they're descended from John Chipman, and I bet the people who went there were loyalists. 
Now let's see if I can prove it. So the first thing I did was I, I just did a Google search for uh, Chipman surname New Brunswick. And what did I find? I found a town called Chipman in New Brunswick. So then I you know, looked a little bit, it's a little town, a couple thousand people. So I was looking, looking to, to find out who it was named after. And I found out it was named after a man named Ward Chipman. He was a lawyer and I think maybe even a judge. Uh, he died in the 1800s. He was born before the American Revolution and he died in the 1800s. And he was born in Boston. So that was my first clue. Yep, I bet you anything. <laughs> he's, he's descended from John Chipman. So I looked at the circumstances that caused him to end up in Ontario. He was a, he was a, a lawyer. And one of the things that he did before the revolution was he represented a, he, he represented a black woman who was basically suing for her right to be free and not be enslaved anymore. And Ward uh, Chipman won that lawsuit. There were a couple of them around that time where people fought for their right or um, sued for their right to be free and won. And so Ward Chipman uh, did that this was before the revolution. But during the revolution, he was a loyalist. And so he moved to Canada and he lived in like London, Ontario. He lived in Ontario, a couple of different places. And he had some like, I think he was, you know, as a lawyer and he had some political appointments, I think in various different places. And at some point he petitioned to have a land bounty awarded to him in New, he wanted a land bounty in New Brunswick. So a land bounty is something like if a soldier serves in a war, then as a reward for their service, the government will award them a certain amount of land for free in some particular place. And here in the United States, a soldier's got those, uh, for serving in the revolution and then also the war of 1812. After the war of 1812, there was some period of time after that, the uh, soldiers, if they could prove that they had served and who they'd served under and, all, and how long they served and all that, they could get a land bounty. They didn't have to, they could They could just, they owned the, the land and then they could sell it if they wanted, which is what a lot of them did because by the time these land bounties came up in the United States, these people were really old. They weren't going to move to Illinois or whatever. But Canada had the same thing. England did the same thing for the Loyalists. They awarded them a land bounty for having um, served in the war. So Ward Chipman ended up in New Brunswick and then he had this town named after him. And then I was looking at, there was a, there was a book on the genealogy of the Chipman family and it was, I'm not sure when it was published. And a lot of times these really old genealogies that were published in the 19th century or early 20th century, they're not always 100% accurate, but sometimes they're amazingly accurate. But one of the things that it said in this book was anyone who was in the United States before 1850 with the surname Chipman was descended from John Chipman who came in 16. 1631 and which seems kind of wild like well how can you know that um because it is true that sometimes people with the same surname who are not related did immigrate here and so you had these you might have three or four lines of of immigrants who all have the same name and they're not related to each other um, but often you, you just have one person with that name like this john chipman and Im immigration was not super common. There was like the pilgrims came in 1620 on the Mayflower. And then they, they came, they were these Puritans. They were coming for their religious freedom. There's a lot of religious um, conflict in England at the time. That's why some of the people were moving to the Netherlands. There was a, a real... Um, discussion conflict uh, uh, revolving around Church of England versus um, people who did who did not who were more following they were Calvinists or something like that I don't know a lot about the history of the religion but there that was why these people were wanting to leave because they didn't like what was happening in the Church of England so King Charles apparently in 1629 said we're gonna I'm, he just abolished Parliament and so in 1630, from 1630 to 1640, when Parliament was started up again, is when you have um, the English Great Migration. So like 80,000 people left England. They went to like four different places. They went to the Ireland, the Netherlands. I think it was Barbados maybe was the th a third one. And then the other one was New England. So you had like 20,000 people coming in and they you know, established Boston and all these other colonies up and down um, the coast. And then in, in 1640, it just came to a dead stop. And I believe that's also when the English Civil Wars began. So immigration really came to a standstill at that time, at least in New England. 
And I don't know, again, I don't know if the English Civil Wars had to do with the whole religion thing. I'm, I, it's not something I'm very familiar with. I just know that there was this huge, huge uh, rush of Im immigration in that 10 year time period. So there was a little bit of immigration after that, but it really didn't pick up until after 1820 when the, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, because people couldn't leave, they weren't allowed to leave, but they're fighting all these wars. Um, and then after that, then people started coming. So the 19th century is really when you start seeing people come into the United States. So uh, most of the population growth came from those initial people who came um, up to about 1640. And then those people just multiplied and multiplied. And that's where most of the population growth came. So then you also had these communities where people were just intermarrying a lot. So you get cousins marrying cousins because that's who there is. So I was pretty sure that Lord Chip, uh, Chipman had to be descended from my 10th grade grandfather, John Chipman. And I wanted to figure out what that connection was. Well, people, you know, he was well known. He was a, you know, he's a lawyer, he's a judge. He did some famous things. And it was early on in our history, so I knew there was probably uh, quite a lot documented about him. So Ward Chapman was the uh, great, great grandson of John Chipman. So Ward Chipman is my third cousin, eight times removed. Now a lot of people don't understand how that whole removed things works, and they also don't really understand how the first, second, third, fourth cousin type thing works. So I'm gonna explain to you how I'm related to Ward Chipman and how that whole cousin removed thing works. So what you're seeing here is a little family tree. There's John Chipman at the top. She, or he married Hope Howland. So Hope Howland was the daughter of John Howland and Elizabeth Tilly who came over on the Mayflower. So that's my Mayflower connection is to through Hope. And um, so the two of them married and they had a bunch of children, including Hope Chipman and Samuel Chipman. Hope and Samuel are siblings, a brother and sister. When they had kids, their kids were first cousins to each other. Most people understand that, who their first cousins are. So uh, Mary Hawkins and John Chipman were first cousins to each other. Well, then they had children. And those children were second cousins to each other. So you have, I've got a couple people here, Samuel Bassett and William Bassett. Um, they're siblings to each other, but they are second cousins to uh, second John Chipman, uh, um, or really a third one, but uh, John Jr., who's in the fourth generation. So those guys are all second cousins. Well, then everybody has children again. And so the next generation are third cousins to each other. But you'll see that I've got the siblings, Samuel Bassett and William Bassett are siblings and their children. One of them had a son named Fortunatus and one of them had a son named Cornelius. So those Cornelius and Fortunatus are first cousins to each other, but both of them are third cousins to Ward Chipman. So just as a side note, uh, Fortunatus Bassett. Uh, I kept coming across that name in my family tree. Like, why are people naming their kid Fortunatus? Sometimes it was Cornelius Fortunatus. There's a whole bunch of them. And I couldn't figure out what the deal was. And it turns out that the first Bassett who arrived came in 1621, the year after the Mayflower. His name was William Bassett. And he, the ship he came on was called the fortune. So once I learned that, I realized, okay, that's why all these kids are named Fortunatus. So how does that whole uh, thing with the cousins um, one time removed or two times removed, how does that work? I've got highlighted here William Bassett and, and Ward Chipman. You see how they're not on the same generation. So William and John Chipman are second cousins, but Fortunatus and Ward are third cousins. Well, when you want to see what kind of cousin you are when you're not on the same generation, that's where the removed things come in. So William Bassett is the second cousin one time removed to Ward Chipman. So what you do is you look at where is the closest relationship and the cousin line, and then you count generations down from there. So William Bassett and John Chipman are cous second cousins to each other. So that means John's son is the second cousin one time removed. And then if you look at here, you can see how Mary Hawkins up there, she's first cousins to the older John Chipman there, but she is the first cousin two times removed 
toward Chipman. So that's how those generations they used to look at where is the if the closest relationship which is first cousins because you're looking at Mary in one column and you're looking at Ward in the other. So you look at the closest relationship and then you count down generations. So when you're looking at um, the children of Mary Huckins and Nathan Bassett, you see that I have two children shown for them, Samuel Bassett and William Bassett. Well, why, why am I showing you that? Well, here's an example of first cousins one time removed. So William and Samuel each had children that were first cousins to each other. So Cornelius Bassett is first cousins to the siblings Fortunatus and Nathan Bassett. But Cornelius's daughters are first cousins once removed with Fortunatus and, and Nathan Bassett. Well, why do I care? Why do we care about that? Turns out because they married each other. <laughs> This, the Bassett sisters married the Bassett brothers who were their first cousins once removed. So that kind of adds a little kink in things when you look at the entire family line. So here's the entire family line going from John Chipman down to Ward on Chipman on the right, where you can find his third cousin is both Cornelius Bassett, but also Fortunatus Bassett who married Cornelius's daughter Sarah. So Ward Chipman is the third cousin of Fortunatus Bassett. He's the third cousin once removed of Sarah. So you, if you wanted to follow each of their lines, you know, their children were both, you know, third cousin uh, once removed and the first cousin twice removed. You know, it's, it gets a little confusing. So we just follow the person who's closest to the common ancestor, which is Fortunatus. So Ward Chipman is third cousins with Cornelius Bassett and he's third cousins with Fortunatus Bassett and from there we could follow Fortunatus's line down to me. So my dad is the third cousin seven times removed to Ward Chipman which makes me third cousin eight times removed. And that is how I am connected to the Chipman's block mitten pattern, which makes me so excited that I can't tell you. So uh, I'll be knitting a pair of those mittens uh, in the next few days. I'm really excited about it. And I will hope to show those to you next week. So I would be really curious if any of you have particular uh, knitting traditions that in your own family, whether it's a sort of an ethnic or cultural knitting tradition, but particularly any of you in the North, in North America, if you have discovered some sort of a traditional pattern that has been passed down from one generation to another. Now it could be something that somebody cut out of a magazine three generations ago that your great grandmother made and, and everybody's been making it since then. I'm just really curious about that because this is the first time I've ever had anything like this. I mean, I do have my grandmother's knitting patterns and I know which ones that she knit for, for us. But otherwise, I really, I really don't have anything. And so this is the first time I really felt um, that I've got a connection to a knitting tradition. And I'm very excited about it. So that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week.